Aloha and welcome to this screencast on the fundamentals of Meteor. And my idea for this screencast is to give you kind of the conceptual overview of how a web application with uh, built with Meteor is fundamentally different from web applications built with other more traditional frameworks. And I think this is really important. Once you understand this, then a lot of the details of building web apps with, with Meteor, at least you'll understand the motivation behind um, why things are organized the way they are and you know what you need to do to think differently and, and build the app successfully. The first thing is you might be tempted to say, well, Ruby on Rails is a web app with that's built with Ruby, and Spring is a web app that's built with Java, and Django is a web app that's built with Python, and the major difference is just, and, and that Meteor is a web app built with jo JavaScript, and the difference is just the programming language. But in fact, that's not true. It's with Meteor, the difference is far more than just the fact that we're using JavaScript. In fact, Meteor is fundamentally different at an architectural level from all those previous web frameworks. And the reason is really simple to state. It's not based upon the request response cycle, which until Meteor came along was thought to be just an axiomatic part of building a web app and you couldn't really get around it. So this is a, this is a really huge change and I think is a big reason why Meteor became so popular so quickly because they, they rethought something that people didn't think was able to be rethought. So in case you don't understand the res request response cycle, let me just quickly show you some animations to, to kind of give you the vibe of it, right? Um, we start off, we got a server, it's got a database, we got a couple browsers, Chrome or whatever in our database, we got some data, right? So the way the request response cycle works at a really high level is the browser is going to issue a request. They might type in http colon foo.com.car into their browser and hit return. That creates a, a get request for the server that's, that's receiving requests for foo.com on port 8080. And then the server is going to access the database because it's got to find out about this car thing. And then the server is going to generate some HTML and it's going to re return that HTML to the browser, and the browser is displaying that thing in, in the client page. Okay, so that's um, pretty straightforward, right? If you want to submit data, if the, if the client actually wants to provide data to the server, um, we start off with, with you know, our situation. Now we're going to make a request which is called a post request. You could also have a put request, but, but typically you're filling out a form which typically results in a post request. So we get some kind of URL where we got some arguments that kind of explain what, you know, the new car is going to be. It's going to be a General Motors car. And so now there's a database access. And now we've replaced the car field in the database from Ford to GM. And then we're going to generate some HTML, assuming that, you know, we want to show what the new car is. And we send back some HTML indicating that our car is now a GM. And then we display it in the browser. Okay. So that's the request response cycle. Um, and uh, the problem occurs in some sense when you try to, when you, when you combine the two with multiple browsers. So let's see what happens. We start off, we're going to make our request for a car, we're going to do a database access, generate the HTML, respond. Okay, we got Ford in our one browser. Now, um, Another client who's also connected is going to actually try to update the database and say, no, car should really be GM. So they replace the GM value and generate an HTML is generated for that browser and it's responded. Now, this is the this is kind of the fail moment, which is that all of the other clients that were displaying that page before our client on the right updated are still going to display Ford even though you can see the the, the real state of the of the database is GM and only one client is actually showing that that uh, correctly all of the other browsers have to explicitly do another HTTP request before they can get the correct data being displayed for them okay so the deal with request response cycle is that the client just like you see request response, you don't see response request or whatever. The client has to initiate all of the interactions with the server. And then the server builds the HTML for all the clients. That's it's not kind of a requirement of request response, but it's traditionally what always happens. And the implications of this is that every change 
to the client state requires you interact with the server to find out what the new state is. And typically, every change requires a rebuild of the entire page because the server is sending back the HTML for the page. So, you know, that's what's, what's going to happen. Okay, so there's some, you know, implications of this that aren't so good. If you imagine a chat app, you know, where you, you type something in and you're expecting, you know, everybody who's in your chat session to see the updates, how, how do you do that? You know, it, it, you, you don't expect everybody to be constantly clicking some button to initiate an interaction to see the, to the, see the state. Um, the server seems like it's getting hammered with a lot of stuff. Um, and in fact, the client seems like it's not doing as much as it could be doing, right? Okay, and so the important thing to see from this also is that all your mobile apps don't work this way, okay? Um, there's not a refresh, you know, apart from an actual browser app on your mobile app, but, you know, if you're looking at Facebook or you're looking at your, your Google Map app or, you know, Twitter or anything else, you don't have to push a button to get this recent state. Things just kind of show up. The, the, the window is being refreshed and updated constantly in real time um, when new things occur, and you don't have to interact with it to, to see those updates. And this is called reactivity, or this is the kind of the term of art for this. If you have a reactive application, like a mobile app, it's going to actually uh, not require you to request something in order to get updates to state. Okay, so here's the $32 million question. I'll let you ponder why I use that particular amount of money. Um, how can we build web apps that easily provide reactivity, this kind of real-time user experience that is the de facto state for mobile apps, except in a web application development scenario. Um, and the answer that the Meteor folks came upon was, you know, we got to get rid of this request response cycle. If we can do that, we can actually start to think about um, building web apps that are like that have the same property of mobile apps. And then the interesting thing there is it's like, well, wow, now I can actually build mobile apps using a web app framework that, that you know, behave like a mobile app should. So this, this idea of doing cross-platform development where you've got one code base that is a mobile app, you know, is a, it can even be translated into a native mobile app plus works on the web. Um, all of that becomes much simpler to do. Okay, so the special sauce with Meteor is we're not going to use the request response um, kind of paradigm for client server interaction. Um, now you have to do an initial HTTP get just to, to get started, okay, but in general we're not going to be uh, requiring the uh, client to always have to initiate a request in order to get updated state. Second thing that's going to happen is for, for various reasons we're going to to decide we're going to use Mongo for the server database and then we're going to implement a kind of a custom version of Mongo that can actually be downloaded and run inside your browser session and this is called mini Mongo okay and then we're going to implement we I say we it's not me but it's you know the meteor people came up with this idea of implementing a new kind of protocol that would be kind of take effect after your initial interaction with the server that's called DDP, and the, and the big thing that DDP, DDP does is to make sure that there will be consistency maintained between the state of your world on the server and the state of the world in all of these little client databases. Because now we've got like the server database, and then every single client running everywhere has got their own little database called Minimago that's running inside their browser. Okay, so when, once you have come up with those ideas, which I, I really think is super cool. When I first saw, you know, read about Meteor and saw the presentations, I was, I was, I was super impressed at this idea. This is creative. Okay, so, um, so let's say, you know, your initial uh, request, you know, to a server to get a page that's been implemented using Meteor, you'll make your HTTP request get just like always. And then what's going to happen is the server that's running Meteor um, in Node, by the way, is going to return a package of, that's going to include HTML and, J and JavaScript. And it's going to actually create this local database, um, lo local database system called MiniMongo. And then it'll initialize that local 
local mini Mongo database with whatever is appropriate for the client. We'll get to that a little later. And then I'll run some JavaScript to actually make sure that the page shows up. So let's pretend that the first, you know, what the browser is actually displaying is welcome, okay, after you've connected to it initially. But now you can see we, instead of just having one single database that the server is managing and sending back HTML, actually what's happening is we've now put a little database inside the client where the client can actually access the state of the world and also has all the HTML they might need to display all of the pages in the application. Pretty crazy. Okay, so let's see what happens now when we're navigating around this new kind of site after initialization. So let's say, you know, we've... We've clicked a button that's some, in some kind of nav bar that says, I want the page, quote unquote, that's going to display my current car. Okay? Remember before, that would have you know, resulted in a, in a get request to go to the server to build the HTML. Now with Meteor, it's like, no, we're not even going to interact with the server for that. Instead, we'll access the local database, we'll access our local copy of the HTML, HTML and we'll just render the page. Okay, no, no actual interaction required. Crazy, I think. Okay, but crazy like a fox, you know, really, really pretty cool. Okay, now here's, so that was, that was kind of immediately neat, right? All of a sudden you've got clients being able to do stuff without interacting with a server at all, which has, you know, this, the scalability benefit. Okay, now we've got a situation where we've got multiple connected clients They've all downloaded this, you know, our, our app that's running Meteor, and, it, and they're all displaying that the current car is Ford. So you can see, you know, in our, in our server database, we've got the, the value of the car field is Ford. Our local databases have the value of the car field being Ford, and they're all displaying it on their pages, okay? So now let's see what happens, okay? Um, this browser is going to click a button to say, I want the car to actually be GM. So... Um, and the, this, <laughs> the details of how this is all going to work in practice, the, the, the ordering can change a little bit. But in general, what's going to happen is the first thing that happens, I go back, is that we're going to update our local database and we're going to re-render the page so this client sees GM. Okay? The second thing that happens is that uh, we'll go to the server and we'll now update our server database. Okay? So the master database now has um, updated state. And then the third thing, which is super cool, is this server knows about all of the clients that are connected to it. So it goes to all the clients that are connected, and it's going to update their database to show the fact that, that the value of the car field should now be GM. And that causes the clients to all automatically refresh the page, not, not by pushing a button, but just it will refresh in front of your eyes with the new value of the database. So now it's, it's going to look like a mobile app. If somebody changes the state on one side, then the server is going to make sure that everybody else is going to see that change in some short period of time. Now there's all sorts of crazy terms you're going to hear, latency compensation and meteor methods and all this stuff that kind of control the exact order with which these things are done and, and what happens when bad things are requested and so forth. But you know, in the general case, what I want you to just understand is that that this is this is the vibe of it that we've got multiple databases little mini databases on each client and that updates are going to get propagated across the system and because all of the browsers rely upon looking at their local database to see what the state is as soon as that state changes they can just refresh themselves and we get that kind of mobile uh, reactive experience okay so what do we know so far Meteor has abandoned the request response cycle, which we, as we saw before, has some you know, architectural problems because if you abandon the request response cycle, it, it, it gives you the freedom to create an easier way in your architecture to provide reactive applications. Traditional way, you, know, you, you request pages from the server and the server generates the HTML. The Meteor way is the clients render each of their pages by accessing their local, ver local version of the DB in Minimongo. And the, the big job of a server is to make sure that all these local databases are kept up to date as changes from any client are coming in. Okay, so that's cool, right? Um, that's, this is the good news. Okay, so good news, the good news is, is what I've showed you so far. Now we're gonna kinda get into the bad news. It's not really bad news, but it's basically the news is 
okay, now we've abandoned the traditional architecture. Well, what takes it, its place? And when you actually, you know, get into the devilish details of making this highfalutin reactive architecture mini manga thing actually work in practice, there's quite a few things you have to think about and do differently than you might if you were using a traditional architecture. So I want to just start with, I want to go over kind of the top level things that you're going to run into most quickly when you're first starting developing applications with Meteor. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of other things as well, but I'm, I'm hopeful that the initial kind of, you know, barrier to entry with Meteor, if you understand this is what you should be expecting to worry about, it'll be, it'll go a little faster and easier for you. The first thing is, where does my code run? Okay, so Meteor is JavaScript all the way down. It runs JavaScript on the client. It runs JavaScript on the server. And because of that, it turns out there's actually three possibilities for where any line of code that you've written in your system is going to actually be executed. One situation is where the code is only going to run on the server and should never run on the client. And I think the simplest example of that would be I got some little cron job I want to have run on the server that goes out once a day and, or once an hour or whatever and fetches weather data from some you know third-party weather service and then once it gets that data it updates my my server database which would then you know trigger um, a propagation of that state out to all the clients and now all the clients are seeing dynamically updated weather data in real time but you don't want every single client going out to that weather place you know it's more convenient to just simply get that data once, do whatever transmogrification you need, get it in the server database in the way it is, and, and, and the client overhead is, is much smaller. So that's one, the code runs only on the server. Second idea, second possibility, the code runs only on the client. That means, that or a good example of that is any of the, your user interface code. So you've got form data, you've got some buttons, you've got semantic UI, you know, with some JavaScript for that whatever that code only runs on the client but then the third possibility which is kind of crazy but cool um, is that you can have code that runs on both the client and the server okay and and you'll hear this thing isomorphic javascript okay which is this idea of javascript can run on both client and server yeah, i don't know you know it's it's cool and everything um, the the best example of this i think is that since you've got this mini mongo that runs on the client and you've got Mongo that runs on the server, it turns out that the interface to MiniMongo is like Epsilon identical to the interface to the regular Mongo, at least for all the common use cases. And so you could write one query, you know, some find or whatever code to do something with your, your, your um, data. And that should be able to be run by both the server and the client. And since, you know, the implementation of MiniMongo is very close to regular Mongo, um, that same code should work just fine in both cases. Okay, so you got these three situations. Well, how do you keep track of that, right? And so what the Meteor people recommend is that you kind of organize your code in such a way that the directory structure actually helps you figure out where any particular code is going to run. Is it going to run only on the client, only on the server, or bo on both the client and the server? And I'm not going to, I have a whole separate screencast about application code structure in Meteor. So I, I'm not going to go into this any more than to say that if you see a directory called slash client, which like occurs at the top level or both in the startup thing, you're pretty sure that that code's only going to run in the client. And if you see something server, that's probably only going to run in the server. And then this both directory is um, probably going to have code that runs on both client and server. It turns out actually this API directory is going to run both on the client and server as well. So it's not quite as easy as you'd hope, you know, but, but this is, it, once you kind of wrap your head around it, this is a, a pretty good organization for the code. Um, but again, more details are, are needed um, for you to really be able to do this. But, but at least now you, I'm hoping you understand that, in fact, you do need to worry about this and it's, it's an important thing. Second thing is, you know, Meteor is all about the database, right? That's the crucial thing is now we've got, you know, a, not only a database on the server, but databases all over the place in each of the clients. Um, so how do you manage data? Okay. So the ideal situation is you've got this massive database in the server. Okay. And then each browser has a tiny little slice of that database that's just 
exactly the right amount of data for them to accomplish whatever tasks they need, but no extraneous data and certainly no data that they shouldn't you know, be authorized to look at. That's the ideal scenario. And the way you get to the ideal scenario in Meteor is by this design pattern called PubSub, or Publications and Subscriptions. So they, um, what they do is they provide you two mechanisms. One is called Publish, and you define that on the server, and that says the server is going to say, all right, and this is an example of server-only code, okay? Here is a publication which is going to, and, and that publication will define exactly what slice of the master database, the server database, can be provided to a client and under what conditions the client can actually have this. So you can define a publication that says, you know, unless you're logged in as this user, you can't get this data, but if you are logged in as this user, then I'll give it to you. So those are kind of a set of rules that the server uses to control how that data, how database, how data will be distributed from the server to all the clients. Then the client, on the other hand, wants a way to control when that data is actually going to be gotten from the server. So for example, some pages may need certain kinds of data, other pages may not need, may need certain other kinds of data, and you don't necessarily want to just kind of download all of the, you know, the maximal superset of all the, you know, the union of all possible data when, when the system loads. It's much better to kind of, you know, when, this, when the first page is given, you just get the data for that, and then you go to other parts of the, the system, and, you know, each time you get just the little extra data that, that's needed. So, the, uh, on client side only, you can do these things called subscribe, which is to say, oh, I'm visiting this page, now I want this particular data. Server, please you know, or, uh, populate my local database with, with this stuff, because I'm going to need it in order to render this page. Okay, so that's publications and subscriptions. Um, and as you might imagine, getting that right you know, is, is kind of complicated, um, and is, is in a, you know, um, it's not necessarily an optimization, but it's, it's something that you only really worry about after you're in production and you um, have a lot of data to deal with. So um, what Meteor provides for prototyping purposes is this thing called auto-publish, which just says, listen, you know, you're, you're not in, in, um, in production yet. You're doing development. You want to move fast. So just to enable this package, and I'll just automatically create publications and subscriptions so that the entire server database is given to all clients all the time whenever anything happens. You're just, I'm just going to replicate the whole shoot and match. This turns out to be very convenient. I, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, when you're first getting started and your database has 10 records in it and, you know, 12 collections or something, then, you know, who cares? Um, once you get going, you know, you got to figure out how to actually do publications and subscriptions. Okay, the third thing that I want to talk about is database integrity. So the issue here is how do you avoid things getting messed up, either intentionally by some malicious user or, you know, accidentally because you just did things wrong. Um, and recall that, you know, the server is the ultimate authority. You know, that, that server's database is kind of the gold standard. And typically, you know, what happens is the server is going to decide and control what these local databases have in them. So how do we make sure that clients don't mess things up? Okay, so the, the, the ultimate solution is this thing called Meteor Methods. Um, and the idea there, which is, is that when a um, client wants to update data, it doesn't have to deal with Meteor Methods just to access data. It can read the data from the database anytime. But whenever it wants to change the state of the database, what it basically does is, is you write this cold code called a Meteor Method, which is going to actually make a request to the server to update the database in some way. And then that runs on the server, and the server, and because this code is actually written by the server and written by the developers to run on the server, that code can actually make sure, is this update to the database valid or not? If it is valid, then it, then it goes through, the master database is updated, and then that gets propagated out to all the clients. If not, then you know, it returns an error, and, um, and nothing happens. Okay, so that's, that's the the real way in production that you maintain database integrity. I'm going to just mention parenthetically for those who are a little more experienced, Meteor methods actually can run on both client and server. They're an example of a, you know, both 
method. And, and by doing this, they implement this thing called latency compensation. And the, and the notion real quick here is that, that you're a client, you, you invoke your Meteor method to ask the server if it's okay. But what Meteor th builds in is it'll actually run that on your local database anyway. And then if the client, if this, I'm sorry, if the server finds that it's invalid, then that update will be rolled back. And that's typically within, you know, a second or two. Um, on the other hand, you know, 99% of the time, it's probably going to be okay. So, in, so because of that, your application has this real, like, awesome responsiveness, right? Because you make an update and it immediately, you, you see the change locally. And then it might be a second, it might be two seconds, it might be three seconds or whatever. Um, and uh, before, you know, the server does their round trip thing to actually, you know, succeed. Um, don't worry about it when you're just getting started, but you'll, you'll run across this idea of latency compensation, and that's what that's, what that's about. Next thing. Um, so we've got these Meteor methods. We can run them. We can make sure the database integrity is preserved that way. Again, when you're just prototyping, it's kind of a little bit of a hassle to write all these Meteor methods. There's some, you know, there's some stuff involved with figuring out how to do it. So for prototyping purposes, Meteor provides this insecure mode. I'm a big fan of insecure mode for development, okay, I really am. I think you guys should all use it until you're kind of forced to not use it, okay? Because you can you can just build your user interface and get a system up and running faster if you're not um, having to learn how to write Meteor methods. Once you understand how to write Meteor methods, you could just kind of write them from the start because they're not that hard, but you got enough things to deal with when you're first learning Meteor. So I say insecure mode is good for beginners um, when you're just building your prototypes. The idea there is an insecure mode, you've got your local database, you um, update it on the client, and then Meteor will just rep, just uh, propagate that change back to the server and back to all the other clients. Okay, so none of this, you know, whole thing, you just call the, the um, MongoDB update, you know, call on your local database and everything, um, you know, everything happens. This is insecure, right? It means the client can like really mess things up by doing something inappropriate and everybody's gonna be messed up shortly thereafter. So again, this is only good for prototyping purposes, but it does mean you don't have to learn how to write Meteor methods and, and deal with them. Conclusions, okay? The big problem with the request response cycle comes in when you want a reactive application. You want the ability to bring up a page or bring up an app on your phone or on your desktop or whatever and have it just update in real time as things in the world change. That's, a, that's increasingly helpful for many, many, many applications to have that capability. Okay, turns out that with traditional web apps using the request response cycle, which is almost most of the non, you know, uh, Meteor frameworks, if you're using request response, you need to get into Ajax and other kinds of ugliness in order to create something that looks like reactivity. And those hacks, let me tell you, man, you, they're not good, okay? Code is harder to understand, it's harder to debug, it's harder to maintain, it's harder to create a cross-platform app. It's, it's really bad. Meteor, on the other hand, provides what I find to be still a very novel, elegant architecture for building reactivity that's relatively speaking, okay, compared to the Ajax alternative, easy to understand, easy to debug, easy to maintain. I think at first you'll find it's not so easy to understand, not necessarily easy, not so easy to debug, and maybe not so easy to maintain, but that's only because you're not trying to do the same thing with Ajax. Guaranteed, if you're trying to do it the old way and keep re and have reactivity, it would be harder for you. Okay, um, so that's what I got. Hope you enjoyed this brief overview and good luck with your meteor development.